People are prompt. You too. Yeah. So we'll be receiving a, te a text in the chat, I guess. Yeah, when, when you get to, when you're good to start. Have that open. Okay. And so are they admitting people to the waiting room? I guess? Yes, I think, I think right now no one's, I think they're waiting till one on the dot and then they'll just admit all. Oh. Okay. I believe they can probably also hear us <laughs> so they can jump in and correct if we're wrong. True. Hello, Klaus. Hi, everybody. Hi, Vivian. Hi, Vivian. How are you? Good to Good see time. you. Thank you for, again, for um, doing the introduction and the moderation. I look forward to the lecture. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I guess we will get started shortly. Go for it. Um, okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Julianne Starling, and I'm here to welcome you to the Jeffrey Cook Memorial Lecture presented by Kelly Doran. First, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We recognize that people are coming from all over the world this year as we transition to this new normal. We encourage you to find the Indigenous history of the land that you currently call home. We are grateful to all those that came before us. The lecture today delivered by Kelly Doran, senior principal of the London office at Mass and a graduate of our school receiving his MARC in 2008 is presented in the name of Jeffrey Ross Cook as the Jeffrey Cook Memorial Lecture. The faculty expresses its appreciation to the Jeffrey Cook Charitable Trust, which was established in 2005 to pay tribute to the architect Jeffrey Cook, who was born in Canada and studied architecture at the University of Manitoba. In addition to being a registered architect, Jeffrey Cook was a member of the American Institute of Architects, an elected member of the International Committee of Architectural Critics, and an honorary fellow of the RIBA in London. Widely acknowledged as one of the pioneers of solar and bioclimatic design, he ran a master's course in solar energy design at Arizona State University, which due to its due to his international reputation and dedication as a teacher, attracted students from temperate countries around the world. The trust, which continues with Jeffrey Cook's life work and legacy, has as its focus the opportunities of the built environment and its interaction with the natural environment in securing human sustainability and enhancement. This includes passive and, and low energy design, respect for indigenous cultures, and the wise use of local resources in the built environment. We are grateful to the Jeffrey Cook Charitable Trust for its philanthropic grants to the faculty to support research, the annually recurring memorial lecture, and its support of student travel related to selected design studios. Joining us today are Dr. Rachel Fletcher and William Roberts, both trustees of the Trust, and a special acknowledgement is due Professor Emeritus Klaus Dunker and Mariut Junker, who as advisors have generously stewarded the relationship between the trust and the faculty over many years. 
Kelly leads Mass Design Group's London studio, overseeing work in East Africa and Europe. He joined Mass in 2014 to lead its Kigali office and grew the practice from eight employees to 80 over a five year period. Kelly has led the design and implementation of several of Mass's projects across East Africa, notably the award-winning Munini District Hospital and Rwanda's Ministry of Health Typical Hospital Plans, headquarters for both the One Acre Fund and Andela in Kenya, and the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. Kelly is a graduate of the University of Toronto, a recipient of the Canada Council's Prix de Rome for Emerging Practitioners, and has held teaching positions at the Bartlett School of Architecture, Harvard University, and the University of Waterloo. Hi everyone, my name is Juliette Cook. Uh, the format for today's event will be a presentation from Kelly Doran with time at the end for a Q&A. This lecture is being recorded and broadcast on our YouTube channel. Please turn off your cam camera if you do not wish to be recorded. We ask that you keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. During the Q&A, please type your questions in the chat. Alternatively, you can identify yourself in the chat as someone who wants to ask a question and we can unmute you. I would now like to invite Kelly Doran. Hi, you see my screen okay? Yeah. Great, thank you. I mean, it's an absolute honor to be back uh, at Daniel's and you know, really the connection um, that I speak to here, Jeffrey Cook's work and the legacy. I think there's a real connection and, and um, hopefully I think I can live up to the expectations of, of the funding here. Um, I was gonna start with a, uh, it's, been, it's been 13 years since I last spoke at Daniel's. This is my thesis uh, review where you can see I'm wearing a shell and a, and a petrochemical hat and, uh, and Mason White there is in the corner as my thesis advisor. Um, after, after my review, I spent the better part of four to five years working around the world on resource development projects, uh, the oil sands um, in copper mines and zinc mines in places like Zambia, Mongolia and Panama, really understanding where materials are coming from and what, what it looks like at the far end of the supply chain. I then uh, moved to Kigali about seven years ago to join a mass design group and, and work across uh, Africa in a much different context, I'd say from a mine camp to you know, working in communities, doing housing, doing healthcare, and really understanding architecture in a fundamentally different way. MASS stands for a model of architecture that serves society. Uh, we're 120 architects, engineers, writers, filmmakers, and researchers coming from 20 different countries across the globe. And we, start out, uh, we set out uh, 12 years ago with the basic idea that architecture is never a neutral act, that it can either hurt or heal. And today I wanna talk about a kind of a redux of this, this understanding and around the word sustainability and sustainable. Architecture is never sustainable. It can either be climate negative or positive. And to frame today's discussion around climate specifically, I refer back to the IPCC's uh, note here from two years ago now um, that says in this decade, the one we are now in, the one we have 9.2 years left in, we need to have the current levels of emission by 2030 if we wanna maintain warming at a 1.5 degree Celsius level. For architects, engineers, and people in the built environment, this is a profound question. How do we do this? Us, the professions that are responsible for 40% of emissions, buildings and their new construction being 11% and the operations of what's already out there, the other 28%. This is a compounding problem because every month on earth, we are building the equivalent of a New York City, all five boroughs. And that means every month we're kicking in another New York City to heat and cool on top of what we've already got to do. It's also an urgent problem. As you can see here, not a lot of attention has been focused on embodied carbon until, until recently. And in this decade, the one we're in, embodied carbon is 75% of the problem if you're bringing new buildings in, if you're on a design team. This is what our focus needs to be. When we look to the, the food world and we, we see ways that we can begin to understand where we can make choices and, and improve. So this, the oat milk I drink every morning, telling me, oh, that's, you know, most of the, most of the emissions from a cow are up on the farm and not at that's, that's where I should be looking uh, for that. Alternatively in architecture, we're surrounded by information that uses the word sustainable 
from companies like Dow here uh, referring to a material that you'll, you'll see is anything but. Our focus today in the profession, in the academy, in, the, in our ongoing education has been around operational use. What you do to heat and cool the building and how you limit that over the building's life. But we need to see the bigger picture. This is the full life cycle of a project. And we really need to be spending more time front end where architects actually have agency to make decisions because once it's in use, we're no longer in control. I've been reflecting a lot on uh, my own education and thinking about what, what it means to be a sustainable architect, to practice sustainability. And this is the cottage I did for my, my, my family a few years ago. It was featured in Dwell and was let off with the statement, this cottage is highly sustainable, the tightly insulated structure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've come to reflect on it and look at this image radically different now after working at a place like Rwanda. This is a project in the middle of Canada filled with materials and things that do not come from Canada. This is a project that's 100% off grid. It's a remote part of Ontario. We rely on solar power from that perspective, very sustainably minded. The, the design is around passive systems, passive ventilation, orientation, all the first principles. So really doing a lot of right things there, but I began to ask myself, okay, but what about the embodied carbon? What about the footprint of the project? So, um, you know, been, been digging into it, you know, stripping, taking a part of it and, and assessing what's in it and really understanding this wood frame project is actually not a wood frame project. This wood frame project is composed of all the divisions that, that we use in Canada. And that this house is 92, 92 tons of CO2E in it. 92 lifetimes of not driving a car, 92 years, sorry. Only 10% of it is related to the wood frame. 65% of this project is below grade in a crawl space, it's foundation, a place that we can't occupy. And over half of this project is made from petrochemicals, XPS foundation and asphalt shingles, materials that are ubiquitous in Canadian residential construction. And so reflect on this again, when you begin to think about, okay, well, what does it mean to be sustainable right now? Is it truly sustainable? When you look at how emissions are distributed across a project's materials. And I think, you know, what does it mean to actually be building housing in Canada today? And it's no surprise when you begin to look at how we've been trained and how we've been educated that I have made these decisions. Uh, this is 14 years ago, my comprehensive studio at the University of Toronto. I pulled it up here. I got a very good grade. This project is a cast concrete structure littered and surrounded in rigid foam and, and petrochemicals. Uh, the project I looked to and thought about, wow, this, these are, this is the best architecture in the world is being conceived in these materials. Upon you know, entering the profession, the, the manuals that I had that I referred to and the design of this house, are littered with these materials here at the appendix of the standard Canadian wood frame house of 77 items, 10 of them are made from oil. A, re a registered architect, you get a newsletter from your, your jurisdiction. Here is how to meet the 2030 targets. Once again, of the four options that we're showing you, one of them filled with EPS. And notably under the term sustainability, embodied carbon is very high as EPS is made from non-renewable fossil fuels. This admission, that this is sustainability. RAIC, when you go to do your conti continuing education, you go to their website and you see everything that's put forth to you is how to continue being educated as an architect. Owens Corning on the front page. Owens Corning, sign up for a webinar. We'll teach you how to use this material. XPS foam. Join the Owens Corning free webinar for a net zero ready performance by 2030. What does that mean? Courtesy of uh, friends at KPMB Labs and the studio we're doing right now, they've been looking at these insulations and when actually do they offset? When do they actually zero out? And on the left and the right, two options you have today in practice. The left, the material I chose, does not zero out for 27 years, assuming gas heating. The option on the right zeroes out this year. This is this family of materials. Not only has it got embodied carbon problems, it is littered with environmental problems. Nothing you would want to live next to. And we have alternatives. We know there are alternatives out there that are actually carbon positive, like wood fiberboard, a material that's very difficult to source in Canada, never mind North America right now. 
So I think we need a new lexicon. We have to move away from this term sustainability. And I would suggest we borrow from the slow food movement. Good, clean, fair. I'm going to talk about passive systems and how those apply. I'm also going to talk about, I think, also a return to regionalism as where the practice needs to move forward to address the radical demands asked of us. At Mass, we've been thinking about how to take this good, clean, fair uh, language and bring it to our work to help us um, understand where we are moving. Good, we believe everyone deserves design, that it's a fundamental right, that good design is beautiful, just, it is essential to delivering human rights, services, and spaces that can improve the built world. Clean, that being climate positive is an imperative, it's not an option. Our projects strive not only to be efficient operationally, but the design of the entire supply chain to be resilient, restorative, and regenerative. And finally, fair, looking at the design and construction process holistically from material extraction to assembly to operation ensures we have safe, equitable labor practices. So there's two chapters to this talk. Uh, the first is I'm gonna look at passive systems to address the operational part. Operational, uh, that, that, that part of the pie right now can be split between residential and non-residential. And within it, you'll see there's direct and indirect. The things that are direct source emissions are the, the, the mechanical systems you put into the building itself. The indirect uh, also is very important. You need to understand the grid that you were, your project sits on. If you're in a very clean grid, you have not a very good reason to go to say passive health standards compared to grids that are very dirty. When I arrived in Kigali, uh, I saw this kind of building on the right that was everywhere, this, this 80s covered in air conditioning building and contrasted it with the, the modern projects uh, of the, or sorry, the projects of the 60s and 70s, immediately pre and post independence. They're really informed by you know, the kind of thinking that Jeffrey Cook was involved in. How does architecture respond to first principles? How can design deal with climate? And this, um, this move to the air conditioner, frankly, is probably the biggest climate problem we have in architecture, certainly in the tropics. As you can see from drawdown here, refrigerant management and alternative refrigerants are four and seven on the list of things to consider from a climate change perspective. Alternative cement, a lot of things we talk about and high performance glass are 27 and 32, relatively speaking. This is because the gases and the chemicals that are in air conditioning as coolants are like thousands of times worse than CO2. So we need to really X out air conditioning from our buildings. We started at Pataro, Rwanda, uh, this hospital with partners in health. And you know, soon after it finished, we found our project on the front page of the New York Times here, um, talking about ventilation, natural ventilation in a hospital. This was newsworthy. The decisions to take corridors and put them outside, the decisions to limit floor plate and have windows that open in a hospital, were first principles back to kind of Nightingale and early healthcare design thinking. Something now that all the conversation around COVID is really addressing. I'd say that arguably the most sustainable uh, project we've ever done is this room. This is a, a ward with infectious patients in it that has no HVAC systems, as you can see. Patients rely on the buoyancy of the air temperature coming off their body to lift the air off up, up into the room above UVGI lights that are on the on the walls to eradicate anything coming off of them. And passive ventilation takes care of the air changes in the space. On the back of the success of this project, the Ministry of Health asked us, great, we, we have 29 other hospitals, can you help us uh, design them? Said, well, we'll work and give you kind of basic rules of thumb on how to organize them. So the first was, you know, back to first principles, design, understand where the sun is coming from and orient your building to. Understand where, where wind is coming from and how can you have that as the driver of ventilation? How can we, again, use the buoyancy of the room itself to drive air change with low ventilation plans as opposed to all the mechanical systems that we see in our healthcare? This is almost finished here near Ganga District Hospital in Kigali. It was a proof of concept. And this, the Munini District Hospital, which is currently in construction, which won a Canadian Architect Award and a future uh, European Healthcare Award as well. So both of these have the DNA. I'm excited to see these uh, finished next year. We're then asked to come to Liberia, a climate totally different, uh, at, at zero altitude, hot, humid, rainy all year round. And again, kind of first principles brought to this project, working with folks like Transolar, where's the wind, what kind of run, what's the diurnal cycles, et cetera, et cetera, to drive the architecture. And then this 
the ventilation is the architecture. These chimneys serve as the kind of the, the lungs of this entire building. Finally, a project we have on the boards right now in Kigali with Norquin Foundation, and this is a, an entrepreneurial hub. It's more of an office space, not healthcare. And we're looking at, again, thermal comfort, something I, Ted Kessick taught me. It's a, it's a range, it's not a temperature, right? Um, how do you achieve that range? How do we think about designing for the range and specifically in, in an office environment to help performance? So we're looking at things, passive systems again, like labyrinths and like what kind of facade we can have on here to really moderate the range and looking at throughout the day, the diurnal cycle between seasons to really dial in what we can do. And in this, we're using a labyrinth uh, to cool the building. We're blessed with great mechanical engineers on our team. And things that you would have seen, frankly, in a, in a theater that I went to, Walker Theater in Winnipeg, they used to be cooled with ice from the floor. We're doing something similar in this as opposed to air conditioning. Um, and the cooling is part of the structure. So I'll refer to the CMU non-structural walls in the basement. The basement is the cooling condition. This is what is driving cooling on this building. The second thing is this return to regionalism to address the embodied aspect. Um, the majority of embodied uh, emissions in construction right now are two principal materials, concrete and steel. And that is short for reinforced concrete and the material we over the last century have become slave to. Um, Gettys, when thinking about how cities were operating with their regions came up with the, the, the valley section here, understanding the city is a kind of connected to this larger environment around it. Uh, this past spring, Ed Masria, the founder of Architecture 2030, spoke of cities as mountains, emissions mountains, that 50% of, of emissions can be found in, a, in the downtown core of most North American cities, where the other 50% is within the kind of suburban carpet. And combining these two, I'd argue that we need to begin as architects to not just look at the city, look at our region, and understand how is the kind of cut of the excavation and the fill of the city be flipped. How can we re-engage the places that we work with and we source from to become ultimately the sinks that we need because inevitably architecture is a negative act from a climate perspective. And in the middle, how do we make that carpet greener and more ecologically diverse? Um, I'm gonna show two projects that speak to this. The first is the school we did in the middle of Congo, the most remote part of the world uh, I've certainly ever been. Um, in getting to this place, you would spend uh, eight hours on an airplane on a couple different flights, one chartered, and then you have to spend four hours on the back of a motorcycle going down the path that's as narrow as your shoulders in places. So it's the perfect set of constraints to come up with the project. Um, we decided to use materials from the place. We didn't have any options. So all we could bring in really was tools and fasteners. So this is a project built of 100% of, of, of the place. So earth blocks and the shingles and the roofing were all sourced within 10 kilometers of the site. We did a lot of research up front to figure out what species of tree would be used useful for structure or for shingles. Um, and we went around and, we, and we, we cut them and we hewn them into lumber and we made trusses out of them. Uh, this, this is a material, this is a, a, a species we found that had very similar characteristics to a kind of cedar um, that would be, work really good for cedar shake Sing, shingles, something that we brought from, you know, the northeastern United States with us and taught them how to throw shingles so they could maintain this roof over its time. 84% of this project is spent within 100 kilometers of the site, and that's the full budget, only 250000 um, this is enormous in a country that where everything flows to Kinshasa typically and giving people employment for a period of time where they previously had none. And from a body carbon perspective, we worked with uh, some folks at MIT soon after to begin to ask the question, what was the footprint of this project? And it's kind of embarrassing, and but not surprising that if it was made from earth and made from wood and sourced so locally, it was bound to be significantly low. On the back of that, we've been looking at all our projects. How are we doing and how can we improve upon this? And you know, happy to say that we are well below the global average right now. Um, a project of, of mine that opened a couple of years ago is like nine tenths the average. And this is looking back on a very conventional construction, a lot of concrete block. Bataro done 10 years ago is 20 years ahead of its time. It's half of the average right now. So it's meeting those targets. And reflecting on this, like we really begin to understand 
that the carbon footprint is a direct corollary of the human handprint in this project. A lot of the materials and labor were sourced immediately around Bataro, and that has been the story of this project for a long time. And then in fact, the project of climate justice is the social justice project. They have to be linked. That you see that the dignity that Marianne and Morris talk about here relate directly to the issues we have around lowering emissions. If we can figure out how the material ecologies of our regions can marry with our labor, we're going to be moving in the right direction, as opposed to a material and a source being some sort of opaque externality that it has been certainly for the last few decades. Erika, uh, the project that I've been focused on for the last couple of years, we're two fifths, and we've been focused on this uh, as, as a driver of design. Um, we got there through some pretty basic things, frankly, uh, starting with you know, roof tiles of ceramic that were fired with coffee husks. I'm Canadian, had to bring wood framing uh, with me to Rwanda, and we worked really hard to change the, the kind of culture of construction there from steel to wood. Uh, the walling, we did our best to get rid of cement and steel, so it's earth-based rammed earth and, and compressed earth blocks. And stone foundations, the biggest change in the entire project's uh, carbon footprint was going from concrete gray beams to stone foundations something that I've, I've reflected on since and thought like, at what point did all foundations become concrete? We're blessed with good civil engineers who like to dig holes and, and test materials. And in this case, finding the perfect mix of the site source sand and clays to, to, for the earth blocks and, and rammed earth. This going out to the countryside to find a mill to source timber. We're lucky enough to find sustainably sources in Rwanda and Tanzania nearby to supply the project with with pine and try to change the culture of uh, forestry. Um, when starting to put together our footprint in something my students certainly know, what, what term is this environmental product declaration, EPDs that basically tell you what a product's footprint is. We're working in parts of the world, there are none here. So we've been working to develop our own. We worked with Ruliva, the manufacturer of those clay tiles to understand their process from uh, quarry to kiln to develop the first EPD in Rwanda to feed into our mathematics. And we developed our own basic accounting for this, going through walls and really digging into everything that's in it so that we could, with confidence, say, this is our best guess of what the footprint of this project is. And the results are there. You know, Putting the effort in from upfront has led to dramatic reductions in what status quo would have been, 58% less, and notably wood frame roof versus steel, and stone foundations versus concrete are the biggest differences. 96% of this project's materials have been ex excavated, harvested, and sourced in Rwanda, a country the size of the Netherlands, half the size of no Nova Scotia. Um, the site, we have blessed with a large site, 1,300 hectares. Um, most of the sand and gravel came from the site. A bit more broadly, more of the aggregate came from within 10 miles, within 100 miles. Uh, we source pretty much all of the weight of the project, the wood, the cement, the ceramics. We had to go regionally to a thousand miles to source some of the uh, specialty things that are not made in country, like uh, wiring uh, fixtures, et cetera, from Nairobi and, and Zambia. Then finally, at a global scale, we're sourcing the solar panels, uh, the battery pack, and some of the wastewater treating, treatment equipment um, that you cannot find in the region. 98% of this project's labor is within 100 miles too. We've been working hard with our contractor to track and figure out how much of this money can make its way into this district, which is certainly uh, one of the more underserved districts in the country. And at the high point, we have hired over a thousand people from the district of Bugacera to work on this project. Um, we've also reached out to find craftspeople to engage to like make things like wall tile, seal tile, uh, ceiling tile here. Um, sorry, wall tile and floor tile out of ceramics. So this Walaris, the godfather of, of uh, Rwandan pottery, um, making thousands of hand cut tiles. Um, this uh, a co-op that we worked with that uses sisal to make things like the light shades for the uh, for the furniture. A project that we had control of the budgets. We did all of the FF and E for the entire project. We worked with local metalsmiths to make like custom little hand um, uh, grab, uh, sorry hardware. We started our own uh, woodworking company to make all the desks and, and furniture for this entire campus of 280 students. And finally, you know, we worked with, it's an agricultural school. How can we, like, we wanted to include agricultural byproducts. So these, as a cooperative, we found that uses banana leaves to weave the couch backs and, and the rugs for some of the housing. 
And we're working to offset this thing. We have an opportunity with a project this big to plant on site, something you probably can't do in a lot of your projects. So we've been working with Atelier 10 to figure out, okay, here's our total, uh, you know, here's our total footprint. We figured out the buildings, the infrastructure was an interesting piece. The solar plant, which powers the entire thing has a 16 year payback period from an emissions perspective. Um, and landscape it's on itself with all the infrastructure and roads and paths like that. So add it all up. We figured if we plant about 20 hectares, we could offset it, offset it this year, or sorry, this decade. So that by 2030, this project will be neutral. And every year after that, it will be a positive force from a climate perspective. And this really just took a little bit of effort to understand what the footprint was and have a plan for offset that was in our control and not some sort of you know, abstract offset that you pay $5 for here or there. Question that we're often asked is great, you know, how does this kind of practice apply to where I'm from? Like, I, I don't see the translation. So if you can do it in Rwanda, how could you possibly do it in Canada? Um, we have to. Canadians have a horrible, horrible footprint on this, on this, uh, in this world. Proportionately here, you know, so we, our, our neighbor nearby and us do not do well, only slightly better than the Gulf states as a per capita footprint. Um, there's positive news though. This coming from the city of Vancouver, leading the way globally on tracking embodied carbon. They have a study out there. They've done a benchmark study of all their architecture and they're gonna hold architects and developers and engineers. If you wanna build in the future, you need to be radically more. Bring it to Toronto. And the reason I'm teaching uh, at Daniels this year is to ask this question in a city like Toronto that we've learned is the fastest growing city in Canada, has more cranes than Los Angeles, San Francisco and Chicago combined right now. And is a city addicted to concrete. Um, we have been fortunate to have 10 amazing firms uh, sign up with us to say, let's look at our project. Let's figure out, okay, let's, we need a benchmark. What is the state of construction right now? So these are projects that are either in the ground or built in the last five years. And we are working on this, pro on this question right now in the studio. So Juliet and Julianne and, and a host of other students are, are asking us, how can we have the emissions of our future construction and operations in Canada this decade? So I encourage you to, you know, follow us on Instagram and come to the mid-reviews on Tuesday. That's it for me. Wow, I got through that really fast. <laughs> yeah, you were very efficient. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, during the Q&A, which is now open, please type your questions in the chat. Alternatively, you can identify yourself in the chat as someone who wants to ask a question, and we will unmute you. This was about 40 minutes and half an hour. I was like incredibly fast. Oh, we've got someone who's got a question. Okay, Carol, please uh, unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Oh, you're on. You are muted though. Can't hear you. We can't hear you at all, Carol, no. Still nothing, no. Okay. Oh, there we go. You're good. We hear you. No, now we don't. <laughs> we got you for a second. Feel free to type it though. We can also ask. Um, in the meantime, we have a we do have another question. So, in the urban building context, do you find that it is difficult to specify new experimental materials? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it, the main thing is uh, you need a good client, uh, and I think you need to do the research and kind of prove why it's as good or better from a very like a variety of perspectives here. Like I think that the 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 embodied carbon conversation needs to be married with a whole other considerations. Cost obviously is a part of it. Life cycle is a part of it, and um, I think that the alternatives that are out there. Um, there are plenty of alternatives on the, in the world. If you look you know, beyond your standard practice, you'll find that like wood fiberboard, I do not understand why this is not a material available 
in North America as readily it is in here in Europe. Um, it makes no sense that we don't have that as an insulation option, for instance. So I would say that that is one and, and forms of insulation that are not petrochemical. I'll just stick on that. Uh, that one for now would be, it's out there, go and pay for it. And as we found in our studio, there's plenty of other things that people are sourcing from outside the context of say North America or for construction right now. Great. Um, another kind of comment, it wasn't so much a question, but one attendee mentions that the emphasis on passive strategies is extremely important and that there's still too little focus on this. Um, totally. Yeah, I could have spent more time on the passive strategies. And I think like really reflecting on what's happening right now and a lot of the building code, again, from what I can see is the more that we're trying to hermetically seal our buildings and cover them with materials that can't breathe means that the building can't breathe. And um, this, I mean, passive house, all the kind of things that are happening in the building code to push, you know, architecture towards buildings that are completely impervious. One, you can never have an impervious building. And two, what it's meaning is it kind of, it's actually a move away from passive breathing buildings. Um, I really think it's a huge question to ask, specifically in places in Canada, like British Columbia, that are far more mild than other parts of BC. Like we need codes that are more set to climatic zones than they are kind of legal jurisdictions in my mind. Um, well, on that kind of note, uh, urban height and density are always the challenge and why concrete and steel have won. What do you see as the alternatives for the tall towers that we are seeing built uh, across all major cities? Good question, Lisa. Um, I don't think all cities have a height problem. I think that's a zoning problem. Um, I, I live in London. The buildings here are not nearly as tall. The general urban form is higher. Uh, so I think that the kind of North American urbanism is kind of, it must be very tall or it's low is frankly, it's a, it's, it drives you towards concrete. So um, in a place with as much space as Canada, I just can't figure out why we have to have so many tall buildings when you compare our cities to places like Paris or Copenhagen or Stockholm that are far better performing from, a, a, from that perspective and use a lot less concrete. Uh, do you think that COVID may bring priority to these passive strategies? Yes. Um, yeah. And the kind of sub question was, how does that translate to cold climates? Good question. We were just talking before this. Yeah. I mean, having passively ventilated classrooms in Winnipeg in the middle of winter doesn't really seem like an option. Um, I, it's, a, it's, it's a huge question. Like, you know, what, what, what parts of the year is your building passive and what parts of it will have to rely on heating, right? I don't really see an argument for cooling yet in Canada from a climate perspective. But certainly if you look at degree days across a year, the majority are in a space that you can design for. And the few that are extreme, um, you know, I mean, historically you shut the place up and you heat the place. Um, the ventilation and COVID, I think we've been working on that and mass quite a bit and how to retrofit spaces and, and, and work for more single loaded corridors. This is doubles and seniors housing right now, things of that nature. I think it's a big question about how the assumptions we have in our building code about how we organize space and how enclosed it is again. And I think in the more breaks you can have in a building. So even in cold climates, you might have to wear your jacket to you know, move around the building a bit more. Um, these are things you see in other parts of the world that I think if we got out of our little comfort bubbles um, and wore sweaters and parkas more often, it could be less of a problem. Yeah. Um, on the legislation front, how long do you think it, it will be before there is legislation limiting the carbon footprint of buildings? And is there a different timeline, timeline on this between Europe and North America? Where, where was that question? I'm trying to find it here. Um, By Monty. Thanks, Monty. I think the, the, the legislation part is the, where we should really be focusing our, our effort on here because we could all be making good decisions, a few of us, um, but if we don't change the rules, we're not going to, it's not going to happen at time. Like the reason my motives to do the studio on this topic are to create benchmarks to say, we have a, we have a, we have a base point to start a conversation like the city of Vancouver is doing. Cause if you're going to, if you're going to half what you're doing, you better know what you're starting from. Right? Like that's the first step. What are we doing right now? What have we been doing and set a target that says, you know, you architects, developer, uh, you know, university operator, 
if you want to build a building and it's going to open in five years, here is the criteria that you need to meet. We need to telegraph targets to the industry. And in an industry where we've seen projects can take, you know, five or six or more years, we need to do it right now. And I think it needs to happen at the city to start with and then go to the province and then, you know, go beyond that. But we need to get those goalposts in for our practice like now, if we're going to make these, meet these targets a decade from now, or we have no chance. Um, the, I think it would be helpful maybe to clarify a little bit about what we're doing in our studio. Um, one attendee has mentioned that it is illuminating to see uh, which projects were on the list, but I think that maybe there's a bit of confusion with regards to um, what the kind of purpose of the studio is and why we're looking at those projects. Um, the question is basically asking how uh, the projects are applying the principles of and reducing embodied carbon in the context of Toronto. Are passive house projects here in Canada good examples in this sense? And what certifications are good at reducing embodied carbon? <laughs> it's a mousetrap of a question there. Um, <laughs> well, I'd say come out to the mid review on Tuesday and see what we're doing. We're, we're trying to, at this point, we're trying to just understand the benchmarking right now, I think. And then from there, we'll go more into the design side of things with the, for the remainder of the year to begin answering that question. Cause it's a, it's a question I think is a lot of solutions like that. How to arrive at half is easy. Don't build as half as much, you know, build, build at half the speed. Um, you know, there's a number of ways to kind of address it. And I'm eager to see how it is. As far as the um, red, like kind of the practices that are out there, I think this is a very new topic and issue. And frankly, you know, the systems that we have had to calibrate our practice to date have it's been blind spot in them largely. And I do think, you know, certainly parts of the country, um, things like passive house don't make a lot of sense. Have, in other parts, it certainly makes a lot more sense, you know, depending on what's your heat source, what's your power source, you know, if, um, if you're in a province that's got very clean energy and you've got electrical heating, you don't have a great, you don't have a great excuse to pile a bunch of insulation on your building. Mm -hmm. If you're in Alberta where your energy is super dirty, you've got a very good reason to put a lot of insulation on your building. So context matters uh, in that regard. Um, I wanted to answer Mason's question here. If that's yeah, okay. yeah, go ahead. That's what I was going to ask next. Um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll read it. Do you want me to read it out? So yeah, go, everyone. please. Uh, can you speak a little about working with local people in the Rwanda projects? You implied that most of the knowledge transfer was from mass to local builders, i.e. stone foundations or wood framing, but were there lessons learned you and mass, or were there lessons that you and mass learned from local traditions? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll say I learned everything about architecture in Rwanda. I had to unlearn everything I thought I knew about it and learned it from people that have worked there. And I have a piece in the Canadian architect coming out next week talking about one person in particular. Um, I think understanding what, how people make things and what they're using and actually spending the time on the ground, like Congo, we like, what are you guys making stuff out of right now? What trees do you use? You know, we, we asked, we asked them for a week, what they build out of. We came with nothing but questions and curiosity. And I think as an architect, your two best traits are humility and curiosity and don't bring any assumptions to any context that you're practicing in. So I probably misrepresented uh, us. Uh, you know, we bring design to it and we bring, you know, Things like thinking about ventilation and things like that, or I think our training is really, you know, our ability to kind of bring ideas together. But certainly from the labor perspective, we've far more to learn from the people who are making things than, than we have to offer them often. Got it. Thumbs up for Mason. <laughs> um, one question has to do with the life cycle of materials and uh, whether there's a plan for materials to be saved and reused so that they don't become waste and whether we're kind of looking at this in our studio right now. Um, uh, the person mentions materials like solar panels not being very environmentally friendly and how do we evaluate the time it takes for materials to decompose or to be recycled? Good question. Um, too early to tell in the studio right now, so stay tuned. We have a whole year to address these questions. So please come and come and sit in on reviews because I, I do think that like life cycle understanding like you know firmness commodity and delight are I think three things we should always be thinking about in our projects as Luke Pond would say um, so that firmness part of it is you know how long is it going to last and are you designing for I think again I'll refer to the suite of materials we're currently building most of our housing out of and other buildings and I'll refer to uh, the one assembly that we're going to spend a lot of time on Tuesday talking about the ubiquitous Toronto window wall that has a 20 year warranty is anything but firm uh, from a legal perspective. 
So I would say it's probably not professional practice to be putting things in buildings that you need to replace in a 15 to 20 year period, uh, just as a basic rule of thumb. Um, I think how things are cycled and reused is really going to be the future of practice. So you're seeing it in you know, circular economic thinking. That's really the conversation here in the UK and Europe and the Netherlands. You know, there's a, a company called Medaster, material passporting. How do you design for, you know, what, from the beginning, you're going to design for the building to be disassembled and taken apart. You know, if we think, if we design with this in mind, we're going to have a very different, you know, uh, form of architecture. And I think the future of practice is in that world. You know, we, we, we all need to become very familiar with this kind of circular thinking here if we want to be in business. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you think that Toronto architects can make the case for low carbon and ethical materials when construction managers are increasingly pushing for value engineering and industry standard materials? Mm. Uh, okay. I mean, industry standard is the problem. Do you want to survive on this planet or you just want to get a paycheck? You know, I don't know what to say to that question. It's like, if you, if industry standard is XPS insulation, um, I don't know. What do you want to leave behind? It's a kind of um, flippant answer, but it's the truth. I mean, yeah. you, you can always say no. Um, we have a few questions regarding the mid reviews themselves. I don't know if you wanted to provide any information on yeah. Yeah. attending those. Um, I, I definitely, I'll post our like review schedule on Instagram. So if, at Daniel's half studio, we'll, it'll be there. Um, yeah, I'll back to Lisa's question about like cities like Hong Kong and Singapore, I think going vertical makes sense. Like you don't have land. Toronto has lots of land. Most cities have a lot of land around them. So I don't, um, I think it's again, context matters, but, um, yeah. The section of Hong Kong is a lot different than the section of Young and Eglinton. Mm -hmm. um, in the lecture, you mentioned that concrete and steel are the major source of carbon emissions. Do you think that mass timber building is the answer to low carbon buildings, considering the grid we have is pretty clean? Ontario's grid, uh, they're specifying. Could, could be, if, if we could figure out how to have forestry that is not a net emitter. Um, and if we could bring practice of forestry and a culture of using our forests and being a part of them again. And then being like a part of all our culture, like, you know, having spent some time in Finland where you drive through, you realize like this country understands its forests in like a deep, deep way. And I think for Canadians, we see it as this like thing that we go canoeing in. Um, it's not really what we surround ourselves in. And I think it's a cultural project really to think about how we're gonna build out of wood. And we're blessed. I mean, the fact that mass timber and CLT is almost non-existent in Canada right now and it's being pushed in places like Germany, you know, just compare land cover and how much of it's got trees on it. It's, you, you wonder, you, I mean, you wonder what other forces are at play that keep it out of the market. Um, with regards to the question earlier about legislation, do you think that there needs to be a cultural shift required to, prior to legislative changes, uh, more of a bottom up normalization of alternative materials and methods prior to top down legislation? I mean, it's, I mean, the answer to these kind of questions is always both. Like, I think you need, you know, we are consumers. We specify. I think our, the, our, the ultimate power an architect yields is the specification. And you write it in there, and that's where it's going to be. That's where the decision is going to be made, you know. So that is the bottom-up approach. And I think we need to spend more time educating ourselves and being, and like, pushing for reform. You know, I don't think we can just sit back and say, oh, that's the code change. I guess we're doing it this way. Um, you know, when's the last time the architects took to the street to like challenge building code? I don't know, maybe at the end of our studio, Julia. Yeah, I, mean, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Um, we have a question here about uh, kind of pushback from clients, perhaps with expectations about materials, and will that create problems in implementing um, passive strategies or using materials with less embodied carbon? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, this has been about. Um, our role in educating clients. You know, I don't think people come with assumptions. They've seen it. You know, we kind of talk about it. Well, they do it this way. So I have to do it this way. That kind of my neighbor built it this way. And that's the world round, you know, um, and construction is a huge, expensive, risky 
thing for everybody. Um, I mean, the mistakes that I've admitted to have made on this cottage, I didn't know any better. If I know what I know now and I talk to myself, I totally would have done something different. And I think it's a matter of educating ourselves as a profession, educating our clients. And I think there's a bigger cultural project of how do we educate Canadians and your average homeowner about these issues? I mean, I would love to have, I, I'm in architecture because, you know, my dad would watch this old house all the time. I would love to have a show focused on building materials and their cultural meaning in Canada once again. Um, and we could all begin to question why, why is it we have all this plastic in our building? What year did the first piece of plastic show up in a Canadian house? Um, I hazard a guess it was probably not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the city of Toronto, we are currently working on expanding housing options through quote, missing middle housing. So duplexes, triplexes, et cetera. Can yeah. you discuss how this type of low carbon building can be used to increase and support the affordability of new homes and neighborhoods? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of focus on the missing middle and our early indications are that that kind of middle scale has got the best footprint um, per unit per meter squared. So I think there's, Back to the zoning problem. Do you want a city of point towers made of reinforced concrete or do you want a city made out of wood that's like mid-rise? Um, what's a better city and what is, what's actually gonna account? It's gonna help us survive. Um, I think there's a lot of arguments for it. And um, I mean, let's, let's prove it. I hope, you know, we've got thesis projects waiting for you guys on that. Um, so, oh, we've got one come in. In a political climate like Toronto, where developers seem to be driving the planning of the city, is it even possible to move towards carbon neutrality? Where I live, there is a 78 plus story building and more of the same scale planned down the entire Young Street corridor. None of these developments are affordable for many Torontonians. They are a result of commodification of housing. Are, the, are there examples of places where you have worked where they have reversed these trends? I haven't worked enough places yet to answer that question. Um, I, I mean, how, how that the construction of housing in our culture and its commodification, as we've been learning in the studio, the most expensive city right now in North America, more expensive than London. Um, you know, I, it comes. I think there's there's a lot of like there's a lot of ways to answer this this problem that I'm I, I certainly don't know enough about yet. I can what I can say is if we keep building radiators down Young Street, we don't stand a chance in hell of like addressing this climate crisis. So. I think the housing crisis that's even been pushed is like, it's not a housing crisis, it's an allocation crisis. There's more than enough square feet to house the people of Toronto. It's just how it exists. So, um, I mean, there should be a whole part of the school just focused on this question, in my, in my opinion. Um, you know, more, than enough, uh, more, more than enough research to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a question regarding kind of the scaling. So with returning to regionalism, how do you envision um, the scale with which we need to be kind of acquiring materials in order to build, how do you see that kind of working out? Good question. I, I, I don't think that, I'm not saying like you can just be like, you can't source things outside 100 miles, like the 100 mile diet version for architecture, you know, there's certain things that you, you, you just can't, you can't get rebar in Ontario. Like mm -hmm. you could a while ago, but I, there's not a lot of iron mining as far as I can tell um, in the Great Lakes anymore, except for maybe Minnesota. But um, you know, things are going to come outside your, your catchment. I think it's a question of like, you know, diet and concrete is a regional material. And there's a reason it's as cheap and readily available as it is. Cause it's right there. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think that wood was a regional material. All of the original construction of the city was stone and wood. Where did that go? Um, and brick, as we've been talking about, you know, so I think regionalism to me is more of an attitude of cutting our global ties. And, and not, not cutting, but dieting, right? Architecture needs to be visible and it needs to be, you need to see the other end of the supply chain to really be responsible. I think that's what Rwanda taught me in a place that's landlocked where a lot of the materials, you know, we had to, we had to work locally our hand was forced to us. And in doing that, you, you began to see how much agency you had and like, oh, I know where that comes from. And I know the person that, you know, sources it. And I know the entire supply chain. So I can say definitively this project is, you know, has labor up and down the, up and down the chain that's well-paid, that's fair, that's not exploitative. You can't say that about a curtain wall right now. You've got no idea what forms of labor existed from like the aluminum mine in Guinea through smelting, through wherever it's been like 
you know, processed. You can't, you can't possibly. And I think that that's a kind of big problem that construction, that's why it has this big footprint. And frankly, all of the places that I spent years, you know, visiting and seeing the kind of conditions of these places and the communities around them, you know, I have a good sense of what the other end of the chain looks like. Um, and if we can't really begin to understand the complete supply chain that we're engaging, we're not being responsible. And I think that is why I think our regionalism and I look, you know, I've traveled to Finland to see Alto's work and like that work was so like it was made within a hundred miles of it and it's beautiful and it's like of the place. And I always kind of wonder like what happened to critical regionalism? Why did like, why did it die as a kind of, you know, academic endeavor? Um, and I think we need to begin to think again, like what does it mean to build in Toronto? Like is window wall a vernacular? Right. Yeah, I mean, I can just speak to based on the studio that, that Julianne and myself, that Kelly's leading that we're in, we're looking at uh, EPDs right now, environmental product declarations, and it's been really difficult to find the manufacturing side of, of things. If you can get the supply side often enough, but to, to dig in and actually find where something's manufactured has been quite hard. And for a couple of them, it's like, oh, it's sourced in Brampton, and then it's actually manufactured in Spain or Australia or some random place that's not next door. So... That's been quite eye-opening for sure. So we, uh, does anyone in the, in the, oh, we've got someone just came in. Cost seems to be the primary consideration in building right now and the lowest cost materials are the ones causing the problems. How much pushback can there be for getting regionally produced monolithic bicomposite wall systems of high durability and quality like the one and just biofiber are working on? Uh, Monty's doing some good sales here. Um, we need more than one metric. Like this is why if we take carbon and it becomes something that we're all fluent in, you know, we have been sourcing expensive mechanical systems for decades through the kind of excuse of sustainability. So um, our buildings are completely on respirators, uh, are highly efficient, highly energy efficient and sustainable and certainly came out at some cost. So I think if we all start to look at embodied carbon this, this decade, we'll, you know, it'll be, cost will be a factor as will your total emissions like the city of Vancouver is leading and hopefully the city of Toronto soon after where it won't just be about cost, but there'll be a target that people need to meet. We need more than one metric in this world than dollars if we're gonna survive. Well, on that note, if there are no more questions, um, we've had a comment that this has been an inspiring talk and we can't wait to see the results of the studio. I also cannot wait to see the results of the studio. Um, so thank you to Kelly Doran for presenting the 2020-2021 Jeffrey Cook Memorial Lecture. Um, and thank you to the Jeffrey Cook Charitable Trust. We would also like to thank our Daniels Public Program Committee for organizing this year's series. To see the rest of the Daniels events this year, just head to the Daniels website and go to news and events. The next event in the series of Daniels Talks, the architect and the public on George Baird's contribution to architecture coming up on November 5th at 6.30 p.m. We hope to see you then. Have a great day. Good to see you all. Thank you again. Real honor to be back.